Hey everyone, my name is Maddie and I'm a tutor here at Cara Tutoring. Today we're going to go over the majority of punctuation rules that you need to know for the SAT writing section. However, before we begin, if you're a low-income student and would like free, personalized tutoring, make sure to head over to caratutoring.com slash apply now after this video. This link will also be down below in the description. To get into it, we're going to be talking about a lot of punctuation, but I want to start by quickly reviewing independent and dependent clauses. An independent clause is something that can stand alone as a sentence. For instance, you must work hard. That can be a sentence. A dependent clause, however, is only a fragment of a thought, and it can't stand alone. For instance, so he must take rest, or if you want to succeed in life. There are a few more examples here on the screen, so feel free to pause the video and read them over if you're still confused. For now, we're going to talk about commas. Commas are commonly used to separate list items, to set apart non-essential clauses, after an introductory phrase, and before conjunctions to join two independent clauses. The first thing I want to just review very quickly is non-essential clauses because I know it confuses a lot of people. Basically, if you can take the clause out of the sentence and the sentence will still make sense, then it's not essential. Lots of times a non-essential clause is just adding information about a noun or pronoun whose meaning is already clear. Let's look at commas with clauses a little closer though. This box surrounded in red at the top is really important. If you have a dependent clause followed by an independent clause, you normally join them by a comma. However, if you have an independent clause followed by a dependent clause, you'll note the absence of a comma. Let's look at an example right under the box. Because it's raining, comma, we have an umbrella. However, when you start with the independent clause, which is we have an umbrella, and followed by because it's raining, there is no comma. Now for essential and non-essential clauses. An essential clause is embedded within an independent clause without commas, while a non-essential clause is embedded and surrounded by commas. For instance, let's look at the independent clause, Mary Jones should stay home from school, and the dependent clause, who has chicken pox. Here, who has chicken pox is not essential because it doesn't take away from the meaning of the sentence when you take it out. Therefore, we see that it's surrounded by commas. However, let's go a little bit more into depth about what an essential clause is. Let's read this first sentence. The man who robbed the bank was caught today. The man was caught today can be an independent clause that stands on its own. It doesn't need who robbed the bank to be a full sentence. However, when you take out who robbed the bank, you lose clarity and important information about the sentence. So this is actually considered an essential clause, and you might note that there's no comma surrounding it. However, let's look at the second example on the screen. Sam Spider, who robbed the bank, was caught today. You'll see that who robbed the bank here is surrounded by commas. This is because by naming the man as Sam Spider, we already gave some context as to who he is. So who robbed the bank is just adding to that, but it's not essential to understand the meaning of the sentence. Don't worry if that last bit didn't make all that much sense, just know that with a non-essential clause, if you can take it out of the sentence and the sentence still makes sense, then it's good. Commas are good. Now for comma splices. Comma splices often come up on the SAT writing because they want you to be able to notice them. Comma splices are bad. It's when you take two independent clauses and just connect them with a comma in between. For example, my sisters and I went to the beach, comma, we had a great time. Since my sisters and I went to the beach and we had a great time are both independent clauses, this is not okay. However, we can make it okay by connecting the two with a coordinating conjunction. For example, my sisters and I went to the beach, comma, and we had a great time. That is a correct sentence. A lot of coordinating conjunctions are known as fanboys, for, and, nor, but, or, and yet, and so. These can be used to connect independent clauses. Feel free to pause and read some of the examples if you want. Note that the comma goes before the conjunction, just like we mentioned earlier. As for our second topic, we're going to discuss semicolons. While you can't use a comma to connect two independent clauses, this is exactly what the semicolon is for. For instance, we went up in the hot air balloon and the view from that high up was amazing, are both independent clauses. They can stand alone as sentences. We can add them together using a coordinating conjunction and a comma, or we can separate them with a semicolon like done in this example. Now. That's pretty cool, but semicolons can also be used to separate items in a list when the items already have commas. These are known as complex lists. Now note that I've literally never seen this on an SAT, but you should probably know that it exists just in case. So let's look at an example. You see in this example that the list items themselves already have commas, for example, New York, comma, New York. Since this happens, we just separate it with semicolons where you would expect a comma, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Moving on, we can now talk about colons. A colon is used to introduce lists, definitions, or explanations. We can look at some examples. Here's what's in my closet, colon, three sweaters, and two pairs of jeans. This is introducing a list with the colon. The second example is introducing a definition by putting a colon after the French Foreign League and then explaining what the league is. 
And lastly, the final example uses a colon to introduce an explanation by saying, here's how to succeed on the SAT, colon, followed by the explanation. Here's look at a few more examples of colons and semicolons, because I know a lot of people get confused by these. So you can pause, read the screen, and you can also listen to what I'm saying. As you see in the examples under the colon side, a colon is commonly used to introduce a list. A man needs three things to survive, colon, air, water, and food. As for the semicolons, you can see that both sides of each example are independent clauses. I drank lemonade, independent clause. Manish drank tea, independent clause. So that's what's really important to note about these. Now, we also want to talk about dashes. As you can see here, there are many different types of dashes. However, the SAT specifically likes to test the M dash. The M dash most commonly behaves like commas or parentheses, and it can even behave like a semicolon or a colon. The real difference is when you use an M dash, you're adding emphasis. For example, an M dash adds the most emphasis, while parentheses tend to add the least emphasis. And what's really important when the difference is commas, M dashes, or parentheses is you cannot mix and match punctuation. You can't open with an M dash and close with a comma. So that's really important because the SAT likes to do this and have you correct it. So here are just some examples. You are the friend, M dash, the only friend, M dash, who offered to help me. As you can see here, you could also replace these M dashes with commas. The only thing you can't do is you couldn't have the first M dash be a comma and the second one be an M dash. Not okay. For the second one, I pay the bills, M dash, she has all the fun. This is where a semicolon could also be used, but the M dash is also acceptable. And in the last one, I need three items at the store, dog food, vegetarian, chili, and cheddar cheese. This sounds like a place where you could use a colon. You'd be correct. You can use a colon and an M dash. Now, lastly, we're just going to talk about some apostrophes. Apostrophes are used to indicate possession or to make a contraction. So when there's singular possession, you use apostrophe S. For example, Shirley's, Shirley apostrophe S, scarf. Or for me, if I had a phone, Maddie's phone would be Maddie apostrophe S phone. However, when this possession is plural, you do S apostrophe. So the students' scores are, were very strong. Apostrophes are, of course, also used in contractions like don't, won't, can't, etc. And what's really important is the difference between it's with an apostrophe and it's without. It's without an apostrophe is the possession form, and it means belonging to it. Meanwhile, it's with an apostrophe means it is or it has and does not show possession. If you're ever confused, replace it's in a sentence with it is and see if the sentence makes any sense. If it does, use the version with an apostrophe. If it doesn't, use the one without. Finally, I'd like to thank you all for watching and remind you to apply below if you qualify. Bye, everyone.